class. I've been able to do it. All right. Let me start sharing my screen with you. Welcome to class, my friends. This will be our second lecture on Wordsworth and Coleridge. Next week, we'll start moving on to uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, a horror work for you. I usually, when I teach that in the fall, teach it over Halloween, but not this time. I just thought it would be better to teach it right now. Um, <clears throat> Here, we, for whatever reason, this wouldn't load the other day, this picture of Tintern Abbey. And that was the poem that I left you with last time. And I, I described to you what that abbey would look like for Wordsworth about that time, circa 1794. You see, it's a church grown over with moss. The roof has fallen in. Uh, you know, a picturesque scene. One of the things to note about this poem is that even though, you know, the Abbey might be the object of the most important historical significance on this location, Wordsworth never mentions it past the title. It's never mentioned again in the poem. You might ask yourself, why is it that he never mentions it again, even though it's probably the most important thing according to most people? Any guesses? Exactly. He's more focused on, I believe that's right. I mean, he's more focused on uh, the natural elements, the natural scenery. He thinks that that's more important than this man-made object. One reason he might have chosen uh, this particular, you know, uh, setting would be because he feels as if in this setting that <clears throat> nature has taken over man in this case right here i love to go out into the wilderness uh, the other day i went out into the wilderness and i found uh, the wilderness of north carolina last week or two weeks ago and i found this old abandoned van it's three miles from any road you know and this van was covered over in moss it was rusted out and i got inside and i took a silly photo for facebook you know and <clears throat> This van, you know, at one point there was human civilization there, no longer. You know, there's no way to get in there now. And it's really interesting to see how nature, you know, we think that we are the masters in nature, right? We think that we, uh, we are the most powerful beings on this earth, and ultimately everything on this earth is ours to use. Perhaps you don't think that, but that was an attitude, uh, part of the scientific revolution and things like that. But it seems as if Wordsworth says, implies, just by thinking about this image right here, that <clears throat> all of the things that we do, what's going to happen if we, you know, aren't around for 50 years? Nature's going to take over, you know? It, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of like, what is the true thing that lasts in this world? Is it the things that we create, or is it nature? Um, so that's another element of this poem to consider. Those of you who might like, you know, apocalyptic movies and stuff like that, if you ever see those kinds of things, and you see what human civilization, you see these destroyed cities and stuff like that, you know, those weren't the things that lasted. Another thing you can imply from just this image right here when considering it in juxtaposition uh, to the poem. Um, <clears throat> anything else? I mean, what, what else might we guess at that might be implied by just thinking about this picture right here? Mm. It's burying it. I like that. Kind of like burying it. And what is it? I mean, what could that imply? Let's think about this thing right here. What does this represent, a church? Some of that stuff we were talking about with Blake, 
like the corruption of the modern church and stuff like that. And nature is taking over it and burying it. Oh, yeah, it's a big thing. It was a huge church. The roof is also gone, almost as if the church is exposed to God himself. Uh, yeah? Can you say that one more time? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, for this particular painting by Edward Dyes, I think the Edward Dyes is emphasizing how small this person is in comparison to this natural scene. I think that's a good point. I would like to emphasize also that <clears throat> Wordsworth feels as if, and I think in a lot of these poems we see, that if we want to connect with God, if we want to connect with something bigger than ourselves, if we want to connect with heaven, we don't need to go to a church. The church isn't the place where we find God. Wordsworth seems to imply that you go out in the woods, in the wilderness, you go out to these places, and you communicate with this natural scenery that God created. God didn't create the church. Man did. And that's the place where you can really find God, where you can really commune with God. It's in a place like this. I think that's one of the other things to add to what y'all are saying. Uh, and Kendall adds that maybe it's a type of punishment, you know, uh, maybe karma. We were talking about an auguries of innocence, you know, uh, the way that karma, whenever you do something bad to, you know, uh, somebody else, to nature or kids or anything like that, then you get karma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. What's that, Ricardo? I think I've heard something like that. I'm trying to remember. Hmm. Maybe look it up and share it with me. Share it with us. Um. <clears throat> Reminds me of something Frost or Dickinson might say. Um, but, you know, to kind of build off what Dara and Ricardo are saying right there, I mean, uh, I think that it seems as if you look at the mountains, majesty, and stuff like that, look at the power of nature. And if you think about it geologically, if we got any geologists out there, and just how much force and power it took to create mountains, these things will continue to last on long after we're gone. Uh, transcendentalism, Grace asks about this. It's a movement in America that similarly, uh, you know, emphasized nature and man's need to communicate with nature to find God and stuff like that. That was a movement that started kind of happening about 50 years after this, but it did kind of emerge out of the romantic movement here at the beginning. Uh, and it was kind of a part of the romantic movement, kind of like a branch of it. But yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Walden and uh, Emerson and cats like that, they started emerging 30, 50 years later. Uh, but all of them indebted to this. Let's take a look at the poem itself. And keep in mind the context, okay? These romantics felt like why did they emphasize nature so much? Because it felt like our modern society was moving far away from that. It was kind of like a nostalgic feeling for something that we feel like we don't have anymore. Most people were moving to cities. Most people were living 
and working in factories instead of on the farm and stuff like this. And so this movement emerges during that time period and tries to emphasize the fact that humans kind of need this natural stuff. And keep in mind that this was before like places like America started preserving national parks and large tracts of land uh, that were set off, not being able to be used and developed. And instead, you would see, you know, in places like Birmingham, mountains were being mined uh, <clears throat> for ore and iron and places like that. Uh, <clears throat> all of these, and then th there'd be just total mountains levied just to get coal and stuff like that. So you could see all of these different places, these natural places, just being used and abused and uh, trees being slashed and burned. Uh, so there was a, a great worry that, uh, you know, we would lose these things, uh, these beautiful tracts of land that were untouched by humans. All right. So this poem right here, Tensor and Abbey is the common name of it, the short name of it. Like I said last time, keep in mind that it is written... At a moment, 1798, Wordsworth had to have visited here five years before. The speaker is the poet. And that isn't always the case in a poem, but in this case, the speaker is the poet. Five years had passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. And again, I hear these waters rolling from the mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on the wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves midst groves and copses. So <clears throat> it's been five years since I've been here, and I'm kind of losing myself in this natural scenery once again. Remember when we talked about while I wandered lonely as a cloud, that first experience of the daffodils, he enjoyed it, but it wasn't until later on that he looked back that he started learning really what they meant to him, what this natural image. So we got the same kind of situation here. And the power of memory, that's another thing that this poem and Wordsworth talks about, this power of memory uh, <clears throat> can allow us to see things in a different light and allow us to learn about ourselves. The poem, see, I kind of emphasize some of the words that are mentioned again and again. When you see a word repeated over and over again, that's going to be a thematic topic. So seclusion, isolation, loneliness, maybe not loneliness, silence. Yeah, I guess loneliness and I wondered lonely as a cloud, right? These words are emphasized again and again in Wordsworth poetry, so it has, a lot of his poems have something to say about this. <clears throat> it seems as if he presents this idea positively. It's like you kind of need to separate yourself from the crowd to find yourself. You need to separate yourself from the crowd to find God. Wordsworth and the Romantics in this period very much emphasize the individual as opposed to society overall. They emphasize how the one person can have all aspects of God himself. I mean, like one person, one soul can be worthy of notice. And that, that, that's very much a democratic idea. I mean, uh, and it's something that's born out of a lot of these democratic movements during this time. You know, the idea of individuality, of freedom, of <clears throat> the ability to determine one own, one's own lot in life. All of these are core aspects of the American experience, and it's one reason why a lot of these English poets really like America and what America's doing. And Wordsworth liked the French Revolution and what they were doing at the time. Later on, after all the horrors, you know, that happened in the French Revolution, he was a bit disillusioned. But at this point, so 
this poem really emphasizes the power of individuality. A lot of the poems do. We see the hermit sitting alone. This need that we got to sit alone in order to find ourselves. So he begins to talk about all the things that he owes to these, to thinking about these beautiful scenes, these quiet, silent, ponderous scenes. Often lonely rooms amid the den of towns and cities, I've owed, owed to them in hours of weariness, sensation sweet. So when he's sitting and he's anxious and all these things that we talked about in that other poem, he's sitting in the town, I've owed to these places, Sweet sensations. These moments have restored my soul. <clears throat> now I'm quoting the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou restorest my soul. Uh, <clears throat> we got something right here. Restoration. In the case of this, we're talking about nature restores the soul. Feelings too unremembered. It's this pleasure. Now, let's start moving forward from that. This poem has a lot more to say than just when I, while I wandered lonely as a cloud. It's much longer, of course. But it's got a more in-depth comment on some of the positive aspects of nature. I think in particular when we get down in this second stanza right here, uh, it starts talking about that these moments have no, to have a good influence on the best portion of a good man's life. That these moments of natural scenery, of this moments of inner quietude, allow my nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. <clears throat> so basically what he's saying here, I put a little paraphrase over here. And as you're reading poetry, sometimes it helps to paraphrase things, to put things in your own words. I said, we owe our better nature to na nature. Nature allows us to burden, unburden ourselves of our existence. I said, uh, <clears throat> So it's almost as if nature gives us a moral guide. Like, if we look out upon nature and we think about it, it will give us moral guidance. It will teach us the right way to live our lives. Or a better way to live our lives. If indeed living in an industrial society, focusing on getting to work on time, getting the next dollar, if that, does, if that corrupts us morally, focusing on these aspects of nature can free us or liberate us morally. One of the positive, we need to dig into it further. What are some of the positive things that he sees about nature? It's like... <clears throat> We see that nature is serene and blessed. We see that it makes sense of unintelligible things. It helps us to understand things that we couldn't understand otherwise. Like death, okay? We were talking about death a second ago, somebody was. Forget who. <clears throat> death is presented positively here even the motion of our human blood, until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we're laid asleep in body and become a living soul. So what he's, corporeal means my body, the flesh. Uh, <clears throat> when our blood stops moving, we're laid asleep in body, we become a living soul. So when we die, we're transported to another place, like a place of immortality. And then nature can also show us that things continue on. There's a cycle in nature. You see that if one thing dies, it turns into something else. He, 
a lot of his poems, he talks about the cyclical nature of, of nature. He talks about moving from the winter to the spring to the summer to the fall and back again. You see, when things die in the winter, they'll come back in the spring, new birth. And that's the nature of nature. And that should be a comforting thing. Nature can help us to release anxiety. We forget the fever of the world. We gotta go get ten, we gotta go get 40 more hours at work, you know? We gotta get those 40 hours so I can pay the mortgage. Do you? I mean, is it necessary? Um, <clears throat> I've thought about it many times. I mean, you can go out to the national forest and stay somewhere for 14 days for free. Just throw my hammock up by a river. You gotta move every 14 days, but I mean, it's not bad. <laughs> no running water, no toilet. Yeah, at some point it'd get old. <laughs> gotta have my internet. Um, and I think uh, right there, that's a, a good point to kind of connect that to today's society. We're talking about, think about second level analysis, what this poem might be saying modern society i mean perhaps now you might say well things aren't as bad now because you know uh, that smog and the coal and now we have child labor laws that prevent children from working like they did and uh, we also have labor unions and stuff like that that keep people from working having to work more than 40 hours a week uh, we have uh, laws on the books that supposedly you're supposed to allow women to make the same amount of wage as men and uh, stuff like that, you might say, maybe it's better. I don't know. That, that, that's something for you to argue. Uh, but <clears throat> today, what might be a message for this today in our society as opposed to maybe that society? Okay. Now we're in the technological realm, right? Going out in nature, you argue, could you know, take us away from the control of technology. What is it like to be connected to the smartphone all the time? What are some of the negative things about being connected to the phone all the time? Mm-hmm. Constantly, I'm getting notifications on this thing. Right? <clears throat> like... You know, I just got a notification from one person who's like, why didn't you respond to me 30 minutes ago? All right? I'm in class. I'm working. Chill out. If I don't want to respond to you, I won't respond to you till tomorrow. <laughs> if you keep bothering me. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you think about those kinds of things, right? <clears throat> this thing is a constant source of anxiety. You know, I got a friend... She's going through a divorce right now, and her ex-husband is constantly just berating her on this thing right here. And I said, turn it off. You don't have to hear him. You don't have to listen to him. He doesn't own you. And if you turn this thing off right here, he has no way to bother you. You know? Uh, <clears throat> huh? Block them, right? Yeah. But then they find other ways, right? <clears throat> So thinking about that right there, I love going out in the woods and like to the Sipsy Wilderness and I don't have any service out there. Sometimes I'll take a bunch of essays with me and I'll grade them by a campfire. You know, that's pretty cool. It's relieving. You get to realize. And I think that that's something that Wordsworth would say about our society. That's a good point. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> some of the things that you see in the news and stuff like that, here we have 2020, we get constantly berated by. We've got the coronavirus, we've got riots, and then we've got, you know, uh, <clears throat> politicians griping at each other and saying bad things about everybody, always constantly trying to rile us up. 
make us feel bad, make us angry, make us feel any type of way. If you break away from that news, it can be relieving. That was the first thing I did whenever the coronavirus struck. I was nervous about this, and so I got away from it all, turned it off for a little bit. <clears throat> but any of these poems, I know I'm presenting this message positively. Any of these poems, you can also criticize, okay? That is a type of second-level analysis. You can say, this is the message that the poem is sending, but this is some problems with that right there. You know, you could say, well, <clears throat> you look at nature, and I mean, in nature, nature, a lot of things in nature don't have the same kindness that some of us might have. I mean, a tiger will eat up a little baby, you know, or something like that. There's some awful things that happen in nature. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> it, it, nature doesn't seem fair a lot of times. Is it better there, you know? Uh, or whenever we were in a state of nature, humans were, Francis Bacon would say, life is brutish, nasty, and short. Okay? Before we had running water and clean water and stuff like that, babies would die all the time in infancy. People would die all the time because just because they never had clean water. So in poems like this, even though I'm, I kind of agree with this, obviously, you know, that's a way that you can do that second level analysis. You can start criticizing the message that it's sending. This is pretty, once you make the point that this is what it's saying, then you can step outside of it and say, well, here's some problems with that. <clears throat> Let's look at this stanza right here. Uh, <clears throat> and he starts, remember I said that he's trying to teach his younger sister some things to help her, to encourage her. For I've learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. youth. Now he's talking about what he was like before, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts and sense sublime, of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting sun. So, again, he's kind of emphasizing this uh, ability to find spirit or God in nature itself. This idea of something timeless, of something immortal. something sublime. This is kind of like the morality that he arrives at. Remember I was talking about how nature can teach us to be moral is one thing it tries to imply. He, it says that he basically is saying that there's emotion in nature and a spirit in nature that impels all thinking things. So God is in all things. He impels all of them. All objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains? <clears throat> so he says there's something natural, a driving force in all of us. we got to connect to that to realize that we're all in this mess together. If we do that, we'll see other people as what I put over there was not just objects, but subjects in themselves. To see other people not as things that we can use, but as a part of us. <clears throat> hmm? Yeah, I think that's one thing that he comes to discover is that he's part of this, you know, uh, and that when we separate ourselves from it by going to the cities and participating in human rituals and stuff that's not natural, that it kind of tears us away from that, your existence. And so, in that poem, you know, When I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, he becomes part of nature when he starts dancing with the daffodils, right? Here's where he addresses his sister right here toward the end. So uh, just looking at some folks that uh, some other folks are saying, if Blake and Wordsworth saw us now, they would have heart attacks. They believe in nature and that nature is all we should ever need. You know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> definitely, this is quite a different step, you know? 
uh, from what we were before. Nature is a type of religion. Uh, although a lot of these folks, we talked about some of the things that they don't like about religion, and it's particularly organized religion. They feel like <clears throat> organized religion. Think about like Methodism, for instance. You've got to go through all these certain steps to reach God. There's like, you've got to learn this and the catechism and all these various things. <clears throat> they liked the idea of being able to find God on your own time, you know, without having to be told this is the way to get to God. That they liked the idea of a man being able to find God just by going out into the woods, not by being told by somebody else, this is how you got to find God. <clears throat> He talks about the negative things that he sees in society here. He talks about the function of memory and how it can heal us. Heal us. Only reason why I X this out here is because I had to bring in a page from it. It's just repeated from up here. I accidentally just had to print out another page. This is where the poem comes back on. Is there anything anybody wants to add about that poem? I think I've walked us through a lot of the key concepts in it. Right. The particular moment that he experiences right there is a moment that is that could be repeated over and over again, especially in memory. And then he passes it on to his sister. And by passing it on to his sister, she can pass it on to somebody else. It's this idea of the function of a poet, the function of memory, is to share experiences like this. Hmm? And that's the way that, you know, religious teachings used to be shared orally. You know, the Bible was written down in 600 and something B.C., right? But before that, the Hebrews were passing it on orally for a thousand years. Maybe not that long, but a long time. <clears throat> Let's take a look at Frost at Midnight. Uh, this is a poem by Coleridge, who was, like I said, they wrote lyrical ballads together. They worked a lot together. They weren't always friends with each other, but they have a lot of same, uh, similar you know, aspects. One thing about Coleridge is Coleridge has kind of like a gothic tendency. By that, I mean he's he kind of infuses this mysterious aspect, this kind of He's interested in ghosts and stuff like that. He kind of infuses that aspect. In the sp supernatural is really what he's interested in. And that's in contrast to like science, you know, because science says there are no ghosts. There is only what we can see and stuff like this. And Coleridge kind of emphasizes that, well, there's actually kind of a world that flows underneath this material world that maybe we don't always see. Modern science was saying things like, there's only physical objects. I hit something and it moves. That's all the world is. But Coleridge and cats like that started emphasizing the fact that, n no, there's more to the world than that. Maybe there are ghosts, or maybe they're not real, but we feel them in our human experience. My daughter still to this day claims that uh, when her mother got married, that she saw a ghost in their cabin in the Smoky Mountains. Okay? She still to this day thinks that she saw two ghosts sitting on uh, the steps and that they were in robes of white with no faces staring at her. She's still haunted by this memory. That was, that was five years ago. Um, <clears throat> maybe they didn't exist at all, but she felt it, right? So Coleridge kind of emphasizes this idea in contrast to where society was going with the scientific revolution and stuff, that we shouldn't ignore 
these things like this because they're part of the human experience. We need to study these things. They're worth studying. And that kind of connects to the Romantic movement because they emphasized emotions and things like that. The scientific revolution wasn't as focused on emotions at this time. Modern psychology hadn't started yet. And this kind of paves the way for modern psychology as we move forward, the study of human emotions. This particular poem, some of the key themes in this poem has to do with the experience of fatherhood because he's talking to his little baby here at the end. <clears throat> Anybody out there got a kid? Not yet? Not in the five-year plan? <laughs> no? Well, Coleridge had a newborn baby here. Okay, He's uh, not an old man. Younger than me at this time. His newborn baby, his first baby, in the middle of winter, when everything seems dead. Again, this poem focuses on stillness. Here we have a moment in nature. He's in his cottage out in the country. It's at midnight in the winter, almost like a moment when everything seems dead. And he doesn't feel very good in nature at this time. He, he's a little disturbed. He feels like he hears this creepy owlet's cry. It's like a baby owl. You know? And he sees this thin blue flame on the fire there. So, if you've ever watched a fire kind of burn low, sometimes that there are little pieces of ash and stuff like that burn, and sometimes it looks like they're alive. And it, you, people used to think that, you know, these were ghosts, these little, uh, <clears throat> what he's seeing right there, a little bit of film, like burning, like the last bit of ashes of the fire. So... That's one thing you have to know to understand what he's talking about. People used to think that's a ghost, like ministering to you, talking to you, visiting. And it kind of creeps him out a little bit. <clears throat> or he was kind of creeped out. But then he says, maybe this thing is companionable. Okay, Maybe it's trying to teach me something. Maybe it is trying to make me as playful as it looks on that little fire right there. And then he starts remembering stuff that happened to him in his past. This is what I was talking about right here. He felt like it was too calm. He says, so calm that it disturbs and vexes my meditation with strange and extreme silence. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> when he sees this thing here, maybe it's, maybe it's not really a ghost, you know, but his mind personifies it. And that's just an aspect of human condition, and we personify things, and we make, you know, like I said, my daughter has these little toy Pokemon and stuff like that that she personifies, okay? It's just human nature to personify things. And so he says... This is something. He starts personifying this little ghost, and it encourages him to make a toy of his thought, just like a child would right here. And he starts playing with his thought by going back to this experience here. When childhood, he was stuck in a city. He was stuck studying. Um, and the English you know, schooling system perhaps is a little bit more drilling than our modern American school system. I don't know. It's been a while since I've been in public school, although I hear that the tests have been a little bit more pushy nowadays. He, yeah. <clears throat> he felt like he was constrained. He felt like he was stuck 
when he was in school as a kid. He felt like constantly people were telling him what to do. He felt like the school system was inhuman, holding him down. He felt like it was a prison. But the way he got out of all of these feelings was he would <clears throat> imagine, you know, uh, let me try to find where I was talking about. With most, how often at school have I looked upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger? So he's talking about this thing right here. They would have fires in school at the time. You know, he would see this same thing. Uh, <clears throat> and he, it makes him think. Think about the places where he had had fun as a kid. So what it's trying to say there is he realizes he remembers back in the day when he was stuck in these places that were confining him, like school and stuff like that, and he realizes how great it was to be able to think about these, not nature in this case here, but kind of like ghosts, these uh, toyful things, uh, these playful things, these playmates. It was liberating to him. And then he talks back to Right, now he's back in the present here, and he talks to his baby, and he says, I hope that you have a better childhood than I did, that you're not, I'm excited now for you because I've moved you out into the woods. You're going to grow up, you're going to grow up with, you're going to grow up with lakes and sandy shores as your friends. You're going to grow up with mountain crags as your friends. You're going to grow up in the midst of nature here. You're going to grow up with the eternal language of God, who from eternity doth teach himself in all things and all things in himself. God is a great universal teacher. You can learn about everything in nature. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to sit down with the books. You don't have to listen to the wise teacher tell you what to think and how to think. You're going to find all of this now that we've moved out into the country, out in nature. And he's excited about that. And this is uh, where we were talking about. There, this is one of the most famous parts of this poem right here, this blessing that he gives to his child. He says, therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow. <clears throat> Whether the eavesdrop fall, heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quiet, quietly shining to the quiet moon. So it's a blessing to his kid. And he caught, harkens back to that first line right there, talking about the secret ministry of frost. And that word there, ministry, it's like nature ministers into us, like it's a preacher, like it's a priest. We don't have to find our priest. In a church, we can find it right outside. And it's kind of a secret thing unless we go and look at it. Unless we go and listen to it. All right, so we're starting to run low on time. Uh, <clears throat> another one of the cool poems uh, is Ode Intimations of Immortality. The key thing right there is like this first line right here. The child is the father of man. If you're writing about that in your quiz, it is one of the quiz things. Look at the care. It asks you about the character of the speaker. And I'll tell you right now, uh, remember that Wordsworth is the speaker, and Wordsworth is much older now in this poem than he was. And so he feels sad and depressed that he can't see nature and the world in the same way that he did in those other poems that we read. He feels like he's failed as a poet. He feels like... He, he doesn't have the same inspiration he once had. But about in the middle of the poem, he has a memory of his childhood. And it's like his old child comes back and infuses him with the ability to see things. 
<clears throat> and so while some of these other poems were arguing that nature can inspire us, in this poem, it's kind of arguing that our childhood, our memories, can inspire us. We allow ourselves to see things again almost as if we're children. And remember that we are not the fathers of our children, that our father, that our children are our fathers. In the sense that, you know, I, Jimmy James Red, Dr. Jimmy James Red, you know, wouldn't be the same person had I not had the childhood I had. Interesting thought. <clears throat> so when you're reading through that poem right there, keep that in mind. If there's any other poems that you might be interested in that I haven't talked about, you can reach out to me, you know, if you want to write about something, we can talk about it a little further if you want to. Feel free to write about it. Uh, Bailey asked me to go over quizzes real quick. Um, <clears throat> we've only got three minutes. Uh, what I would say about quizzes, just take a look at, we can talk about this after I dismiss class, Bailey. Um, <clears throat> We don't have a quiz due on Friday yet, but this guidelines for quizzes and example answers right here tells you what I want and gives you examples of quizzes. It shows you what I'm looking for, 